So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the seminar series organized by the Ateneo de Manila University Department of Economics and the Ateneo Center for Economic Research and Development. I'm Jemmy Lonto. I'm the Associate Chair of the Department of Economics, and I'll be the moderator for this afternoon's webinar. But before we start, allow me to discuss some of the house rules. We will let the speaker finish her presentation first before we entertain questions. To our Zoom participants, kindly stay on mute and stop sharing your video during the duration of the presentation. During the Q&A portion, please virtually raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. You may unmute and show yourself when asking your question. To our participants joining via Facebook, please post your question in the comment section. Slides, videos, and other materials from the seminar are posted on our website only when the speaker gives her consent for sharing them. Our speaker for this afternoon is an associate professor of economics at the University of Warwick, where she teaches macroeconomics at both the undergraduate and postgraduate level. Her current research explores the intersection of economics and pedagogy in higher education focusing on how economics education has to change to respond to how current students engage with the educational process. She's interested in topics on inequality, development and economics institutions, and has previously researched on Latin American economic development and the influence of colonialism. So to talk about the socioeconomic diversity of economics, let us all welcome Dr. Stefania Paredes Fuentes. I now give the floor to Dr. Paredes Fuentes. Thank you very much. That's a very kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, yeah, so let me, well, share my slides. And... Um, So I assume everybody can see my slides now. So yes, uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, work that I report, a research that we have been working in the last year, and it is about who studies economics. And this is quite a long report in this particular presentation, I'm gonna be focusing on the socioeconomic background of economies in the UK. Uh, this is a research for the Royal Economic Society. Uh, I, with my head of diversity champion for the Royal Economic Society, which is a learning society in the UK uh, for economies. And this is a joint work with various colleagues from various universities, uh, Tim Burnett from Aston, Gabriela Calisi from Sussex, Parama Chaudhry from UCL, and Denise Hogue from uh, Rus Anglian Ruskin University. So let me tell you a bit why we started this. And if in the news, at least in, in this part of the world, we read a lot about issues that economics as a discipline has with diversity. Uh, economics doesn't have enough women. Economics has been accused of a discriminatory behavior towards non-white people, people from ethnic minority backgrounds. Uh, the way that we teach economics has been under, um, under the spotlight and the gender gaps in economics, whether this is because of, way, uh, because of wage. Uh, so in general, we have seen that economics does lack of uh, diversity in various aspects. And this gets worse the further we go in the pipeline. So the further we go in the pipeline, we have less women, less ethnic minorities, uh, everything. Why this is important? Well, we know that diversity is important for having a diverse views, diverse ways to see the world. That's what research is about. We see the world in different ways and we try to investigate, see how that world, how can we contribute to explain that world? 
And lack of diversity will affect the way that we see the world, will affect the research questions that we research, it will affect the way that we teach, how we teach, and therefore will affect uh, what the students learn about economics. This will perpetuate biases, and perhaps we're going to fail to attract more diversity. So, just to give you a bit of overview of this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the context. I'm uh, going to very briefly go through the literature, so otherwise we're not going to have time to look into the data. So some are main findings regarding socioeconomic background and economic students, uh, leakages in the economics pi pipeline, and some implications. Uh, just to summarize uh, some of the fi findings, so if you cannot stay till the end, at least you know what this presentation was about. We did find that economics is an elitist discipline. Uh, there is not enough socioeconomic diversity, and this is even worse in the more uh, elitist uh, institutions. We find that white male students from higher socioeconomic backgrounds are overrepresented in economics. We find that girls and uh, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are even less likely to study economics in first place. But there are also problems with progression for students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and ethnicity. And actually, we find that if girls do study economics, they actually do quite well. They are less likely to drop out and they are more likely to be awarded a good degree and going back to these terms uh, earlier in, uh, later in this presentation. And we see that students from ethnic minority groups do worse. They receive lower degree classifications than other students, independently of the universities. But this is what we are going to be discussing today. So let me start with a bit of context. If, if I have, I'm assuming I have many economists in uh, the room, so I'm pretty sure you recognize at least half of these names, like at least half. Uh, if you teach macroeconomics, you might be familiar with the Phillips curve. Uh, you all know Adam Smith, that even if you are not an economist, or so David Hume, David Ricardo, Edgeworth, if you teach microeconomics, you might have heard of the Edgeworth uh, a box. So this is all people that you might know directly or indirectly. And well, what is common among these people? Well, there are some uh, common characteristics that you can see, they are all white. Most of them are male. And I'm pretty sure you are less likely to know the, the female economies in here because there has been, at least in the UK at the moment, we are trying to, to look back and think about the contribution that women did because they did contribute it, but of course they usually their contribution was neglected. So, but there are a few women in here as well. Things that you cannot perhaps see, uh, you might know, is that they were all British, whether by um by uh, born, they were born in the UK or in Britain at the time, or they studied in the UK. So they were formed as an economist in the UK. So in a way, the education, the UK education that they receive have influenced the whole world. And it's not just in all times, because if we look at more recent times, so when we were trying to say why people in Manila might be interested to kind of understand the diversity of economics in the UK. I said, well, you know, fair enough, a good point. There is a lot of policy implications for the UK here, but there is a lot of international students who come to study to the UK. And we were just talking how Bing and I met studying economics at the UK. And, you know, so kind of that influenced the way that we thought uh, we became economists, etc. And there are also people a bit more powerful than being and I that has been educated in the UK and then went around the world and they have power positions. So huge influence. Something uh, 
And well, so let me tell you a little bit more about UK universities. So kind of we are all on the same page. In the last years in UK universities, there has been a strong initiative to widening participation. It's a key priority in education in the UK. So what does it mean widening participation? That means to bring to university more students from underrepresented groups, from traditionally underrepresented groups at university, which are students from lower income families, students with disabilities, and some ethnic minorities in the UK. In the UK, the ethnic minorities, at least the data on ethnic minorities for historical reasons, there is a lot of uh, debate around this, but for historical reasons is collected under a few macro ethnic groups. So this white, black, Asian, mix, and other. And in fact, those are gonna be the groups that we kind of focus here. So it's British people that are either from white, black, Asian mix or other uh, ethnic backgrounds, but they are all British uh, from the UK, actually, not just British. Uh, there has been also an increase of interest, so not just in access to higher education, and in fact, we have seen that access to higher education has somehow improved in the UK for UK students from ethnic minorities. There has some progress also on other aspects, but now we are also worried about continuation. So when the students come to university, how likely are them to progress? We know that continuation is higher for white students than for, than for students from ethnic minorities. And the other thing that a government is worried about is about attainment gaps. Who uh, receive a good degree in economics? And a good degree, and I'll define a bit better this, but a good degree is a degree that most of the times will allow students to first get good jobs. Almost all employers of economies ask you for a good degree. And second, if they want to be to move into postgraduate studies, they need a good degree. Good universities rarely will accept a student without a good degree. And we observe that there is degree attainment gaps. And so this is another thing that we need to try to close. Well, the UK is a very international, uh, the, the uh, student population in the UK is very international. We observe that at undergraduate level, it still remains predominantly UK based. So UK domicile students are 73%, were 73% in 2020-21, has been quite stable over the time. In economics, it's a bit lower, so economics is more international, is a 67%, uh, 70, sorry. So, so far, it's not that we don't know anything about diversity. There are a lot of things. I'm gonna go a bit quick on, uh, through this uh, because of time, but we know a few things already about diversity. And we know a few things about the lack of gender diversity. And we know that that starts at school level. It starts with boys and girls do not study economics in high school. In, uh, sorry, girls do not study economics in high school. So there is already some gender things happening there. And a lot of the studies say this is because of the perception of economics. Economics is seen as a white male working on finance, perhaps in London, and perhaps girls might not be too attracted to that. The other thing that we observe that in the UK is more likely to studied economics in private schools rather than in public schools. So perhaps that helps to explain initially why there is less students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. As we say, economics in the UK attracts less female. Only 32% of UK undergraduate students were female in 2020-21. I know in other countries it's different. So this is something that is very specific to the UK and to the US uh, a bit to Australia as well. So in these countries, gender are very low, but this is uh, looking, comparing a statistic with colleagues in other universities around the world. This is not the case everywhere. And so we see that this percentage remains and is even lower if we consider students only from the UK. Economics though managed to attract an 
greater ethnic diversity than other social sciences that STEM subjects, um, we see that ethnic minorities, however, are less likely to study in a Russell Group University. The Russell Group Universities in the UK are this group of universities that I, are self-nominated, but they are like the Eve Leaks in the, in the US, if you are more familiar with that. So very highly ranked research-based institutions. And of course, employers uh, quite like Russell Group Universities. So if we move down the pipeline, we observe that in academia, there has been some changes and ethnic diversity has increased over time but then remain differences among different ethnic groups. Women were 18% uh, of the academics in, in economics in 1996. This number has gone up to 26% in 2018, uh, but the progress has stalled a bit. And now the percentage of female professors has been quite stable uh, at 21%. If we start looking at these things by ethnicity, we have this very sad statistic that at no point between 2012 and 2018, there was a single black female professor of economics employed anywhere in the UK. So UK still, if we mix the intersection of ethnicity and gender, it's not great. Women are better represented outside academia. So they, in, when they go working for the central bank or for think tanks, we see a higher percentage for women. But ethnic minority graduates are less likely to receive offers from the government economic service. And the government economic service is the main employer of economies in the UK. It's uh, graduates that go to work for the government. So there is a lot of literature on this, and I'm not gonna go into the details of all these papers, but the literature in general highlights few things. Of course, there is underrepresentation. I told you there is underrepresentation in various countries. There is discrimination. Uh, they have also pointed out a hostile culture in the discipline, stereotypes in the discipline. And it's not just for gender, there is discrimination for other groups as well. A lot of underrepresented groups in economics have uh, mentioned that they have felt discriminated at some point uh, within, the, uh, within the, their careers. The socioeconomic factors of uh, economics are less research. There is some research coming up. Schulz and Stanbury did some research for the US in 2022. In the UK, to my understanding, this is the first time that we sit and look just at socioeconomic diversity. Uh, and why we should care about this is, well, for many reasons, there is of course a social aspect uh, here, the social justice aspects here. We should all have the same opportunities. But the other thing is that if we, are, we have policies, economic policies looking at improved inequality, well, we know from other research that actually not as so reducing inequality, we, we know that economics is quite good at promoting uh, social mobility. And therefore, if we manage to increase social, uh, social uh, so socioeconomic backgrounds, equality in economics, we could be promoting more of this. So, in this report, we look at snapshot of the economics pi pipeline. We focus on this part of the pipeline, especially in economics undergraduates. Uh, this is the data, it's a very rich data set that we have. And therefore, it's just important to look at uh, some aspects, to focus on some aspects, but also the economics uh, pipeline is the one that then feeds to employers, to academics, to future. Um, um, you know, uh, yeah, f f become academics uh, from postgraduate studies, etc. So it is a quite important one. So we also see some interaction between socioeconomic indicators and ethnicity and gender. So those demographic uh, characteristics that have been studied before, we look at how socioeconomic indicators interact with this. Again, that's quite new. It has, uh, hasn't been done before, at least in the UK. 
And then we look at how students do by university type, uh, whether how likely they are to continue in education, who gets a good degree. And we look a little bit of what happens during COVID-19, but that's only two years. So let me tell you a bit more about the data. As I say, this is a quite rich data set. We're gonna be focused on the last five academic years for which the data set is available. Although right now we have the 2021-22, uh, sorry, 2000, yeah, 21, 22, but we are not gonna be looking at that, at least not for this report. Uh, we are gonna be looking at university characteristics. As I mentioned as well, Russell Group Universities is this group of 24 universities in the UK that are considered to be like, the, at the top in rankings and it's more research focused university. We also put try to make some different classifications, but what in general we notice that Russell Group tends to uh, represent quite well uh, what they tr are trying to represent. Then we also have age, sex, ethnicity for students. We also have four measures of socioeconomic background. We don't have income. That's a, a typical question I get, oh, but you don't have income. No, we don't have income. That's not a measure that is collected by this data set. But you have measures on uh, where the students come from, which neighborhood the students come from. So the neighbors tell us uh, there is a measure of whether from how many people, how many 18 and 19 students participate into higher education, and then the data is classified in quintiles. Each neighbor who is put in one quintile according to the participation to higher education. So we look at those ones who are in the lowest quintile, uh, so has the low participation to higher education, and see how the students do at university. We also have a measure for parental education. So whether the parents went to school or not. And we also have a measure for parental. So this is a measure for the socioeconomic class in the UK. And we look at, so whether the parents uh, are from a higher socioeconomic background or a lower socioeconomic background based on the parents' professions. We also have a measure on school type, whether the school was private or uh, public. The majority of the UK students studied in public schools. Private schools are very expensive, so they are kind of reserved for a very uh, high elite uh, or people, very good students with scholarship, but the majority of students, only 6% of the students in the UK studying in private schools, everybody else study in uh, public schools. We also have some uh, pre-university characteristics, we look at A-levels. So A-levels are the subjects that the students study uh, when they are between 16 and 18. So there is history, math, economics, and a few others. And so those are the subjects. And we have, and students choose what, what to study. So we have only information whether the students chose to study economics or whether the students chose to study math. We also have UCAS points, which is a sort of measure of what the students have done. We, uh, and we have partial postcode. The postcode is so kind of, we have more information of where the students come from. Not the full address, but some information. So just to give you a big overview of the data, we have 172 universities of which 24 are, are Russell Group universities. 53 are considered pre-92. Again, this is very specific in the UK, are old universities or post-92 are modern universities. Uh, we look at how many universities offer economics as well. Not all these universities offer economics at undergraduate level. So we look at the fact that almost every single Russell Group University offer economics in the period that we are considering. Actually, now all the 24 offer economics at undergraduate levels, but uh, Imperial College just started offering it last year, so it's not on our data set. Then we have those ones in pre and post 92. We see again another snapshot of the students uh, who are in the UK. 
the ones who studied in the Russell Group universities, we see that around 25% of students are in Russell Group universities, 75% of students actually studied in one of the other universities. Uh, you can see the majority of them are UK domicile. The majority are full-time. Female represent 56% of students in the UK. However, remember what we said in economics, they are around 30%. So this is already a big difference between uh, economics and the rest of the student population. The population of students in the UK is very young. Here, if students start university 18, 19 and finish it very very young, and economics represent around 2% of the total student population. And the last table at the bottom is just to show you that at some point I'm going to be showing you only the last academic year, the data for 2020-21, but uh, there is not much difference uh, in student composition across these five years that we are analyzing. So sometimes we just pick a year because it just makes our lives easier. Another big table snapshot of, in this case, is comparing all students to economic students. And this is quite a lot of data, but uh, I have summarized this data. So as I told you before, economics represent around 2.5% of the total student population. 50% of all economic students are studying in a Russell Group University. And this is quite, important for the UK because while only 23 universities, Rus uh, uh, Russell Group universities offer economics, most of the students are actually, or at least half of the students studying economics are studying in one of these universities. And therefore, for this reason, we are going to sometimes look at the statistics specifically for this type of universities, look at the student composition in these type of universities. We see that economics attracts we told that before a large proportion of international students. Something that also we have noticed is that the number of economic students has increased at twice the rate of the overall student population. So universities are expanding in the UK. A lot of this expansion is coming from economics. However, this growth is not uniformly distributed across universities. And in fact, in the graphs here, you can see so, for instance, pre-92 universities and post-92 universities have remained more or, this, uh, more or less the same. Actually, post-92 universities during the COVID-19 pandemic, they lost a lot of the students. And it seems that they have lost a lot of the students because Russell Group universities have expanded. So there were a lot of fears during COVID-19 that university numbers and finances will drop. And therefore, students, uh, so Russell Group Universities started perhaps at trying to increase their intakes in order to make sure there was also a problem with high school marks. But all these issues meant that Russell Group uh, Universities see an increase in students, while post-92 universities, which tend to be more local universities, and this is uh, going to be very important because local universities tends to attract students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, they see their numbers decrease. As I said, only 32% of, uh, of students are female in economics. Economics attracts, most of the economic students are uh, studying full time and they are very young. They start very young, even younger than the overall student population that is already young for in comparison, in, if you look at international comparisons. However, something that we do see that there are not many universities in the UK that offer part-time degrees in economics. Very, very few do. We found seven that are openly offer uh, part-time degrees in economics. And although the proportion of students studying part-time degrees has increased, very minor increases, but has increased. And therefore, we don't know if the fact that most students that are enrolled full-time is simply a response to the fact that there are not part-time degrees. Uh, we also see that the students from ethnic minority groups in the UK are more likely to attend universities. 
uh, and are even more likely to study economics. As I say, economics attracts a very healthy pro proportion of students from ethnic minority backgrounds, so that in that sense, that aspect of diversity is good. But let me tell you now about socioeconomic background. So first, well, I already told you why it matters, but it, it is an aspect of social justice. So, so uh, it is important students at all levels of the income distribution have access to uh, studies if they want to. But not just uh, is a matter of social justice, lack of socioeconomic diversity among economies could lead to a lack of research of some social aspects and even to have a skewed perspective among economies about these issues. Research questions are based on many times on our own experiences, whether we like it or not, we look at the world around us and we're trying to explain the world around us. If the world around us looks for all of us in a specific way, well, that's what we are gonna be researching on. We need diversity in order to look at trying to explain our world in different ways and from the perspective of all the people that live in this world. So it is very important as we have gender diversity, as we have ethnic diversity, to have people that have experienced the world from a lower income distribution. They are gonna have different views on topics such as poverty or uh, inequality or on other social aspects. And what we see though in economics is that when we compare economics to similar disciplines, economic students tend to come from a higher socioeconomic background. Uh, they, are, they have parents that are more likely to have studied at university level and more likely to be on manager, managerial positions. So, to analyze the socioeconomic background of economic students, we look at, as I say, four different variables. I already explained these variables, so I'm gonna just skip this one, uh, but happy to answer any questions on this if you have later. And let me start showing you some of the data that we have found. So here is when we compare economics to other similar disciplines, either because of the mathematical background needed, so some STEM disciplines, or for the type of uh, topics, so social sciences and business and management. And of course, we also compare it to all student population. On the top figure, we look at the parental education and occupation. The bars here are the parental education. Uh, sorry, parental occupation. The green bars tell us whether the students, the proportion of students that come from higher or lower managerial professional uh, backgrounds, while the yellow ones tell us those ones who come from the lower socioeconomic backgrounds, so for more routine or semi-routine occupations. And of course, you can see that in general at the university, there is a larger representation from students from higher um, and lower managerial and professional occupations. So they are more likely to go to university. But what we see that in economics in particular, this is high, this is much higher. We look at 54% of economic students come from a higher socioeconomic background compared to 42% of the overall student population only 10% of the students come from a lower economic background compared to 16% of the total student population. In the other disciplines, STEM, social sciences, and business, we can see that they are more similar to the overall student population. So disciplines that are similar to economics, either because of their uh, entry criteria the topics or the type of things that the students choose to study are doing better, a bit better on socioeconomic background. Then if we separate this by ethnicity, we find that it's particularly driven by white students. 64% of white students are from a higher or lower managerial and professional background. So come from a 
more well-off family. Only 6% of white students do not come from, come from a lower socioeconomic background. When we look at ethnic minorities, in fact, we see that it's still higher than the overall student population, but not a, as high as for white students. And of course, this is also represented into the parental education. That's the marker, the, the diamond market there. We see that they tend to have more uh, edu parents educated at higher, uh, higher education. Now, if we look by university type, so same, similar, but we kind of start dividing by Russell Group pre and post 92 universities, then we observe that, of course, these differences are well uh, marked by Russell Group universities. Russell, higher ranking universities, so we have that they have the highest proportion of students from higher socioeconomic background. If you study economics, 63% of the students studying economics in a higher in a Russell Group University are from a higher socioeconomic background. Only 7% are from a lower socioeconomic background. And that is higher than the other disciplines, and of course, higher than the other universities. So it is something that is specific about economics. We find similar things if we look at the other two variables that we have to analyze the socioeconomic background, and this is participation area. So remember, our the neighborhoods where the students come from, and the proportion of students who come from a neighborhood with a low participation to higher education, and the students who come from private schools. And again, these statistics that we have here are quite uh, saying something in the sense that we see that the lowest economics in general, not just compared to these disciplines that we have chosen, but we compare economics to all the disciplines that you can study in the UK, we see that economics is the discipline that attracts the lowest number of students from low participation areas. Only 5% of students come from a low participation area in economics. On the other hand, we see that economics attracts a very high proportion of students from private schools. Remember that I told you that around only 6% of students come from a private school, in the, uh, studying in a private school in the UK. Well, a lot of them then go and study economics. If not just that, if we look this by university types, we see that students from low participation areas go down in Russell Group universities, they become only 4% of the students. So most of these students go to post 92 universities. And remember I said, these are more local universities. Uh, 8% of them go to post-92 universities. And around 30% of students in Russell Group universities come from a private school. So quite start becoming, start depicting a quite elitist subject, but also how it's segregated by universities. So because it's a lot of statistics to give you a better idea of the student's socioeconomic background, we have represented this in these graphs here. We have uh, three different types of universities. We have, if you have 100 students in the Russell Group universities, how many of them are male? How many of them are female? Those, uh, how many of them are white? How many of them are from other ethnic groups. Here we only have like the macro groups. We have Asian students and black students and mixed students. You can see the, the, the divisions that there are in these universities. So in general, being white male from a higher socioeconomic background is the group that is most represented in all these universities, but in particular in Russell Group universities. So uh, yeah, 33 out of 100 students are white male in a Russell Group University from a higher socioeconomic background. So those are these orange men that you, you find around there, the orange white men. If we look at the students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, those are the ones in the gray area. So we're trying to put two students in the gray area. 
So we have six students in Russell Group University. Of course, these had all been approximated to, to one, so perhaps the statistics sometimes are a bit different of what we saw before, but there are only six students. Two, uh, three white students and three Asian students. Black students are so underrepresented in Russell Group universities that they didn't make it to this, so we're sure there are. But there are only five students here in a Russell Group uh, University that are from a Black background. So you can see how in my field, I would say, like if we look about like the environment, the culture that there is in these universities, we now start wondering, well, how those students from these, like these six students feel among these other uh, 100 students? We see that this, this gray area, the shadow area, grows a bit in pre-92 universities, and it is even bigger in post-92 universities. That shows that kind of there are more students, as I said, more students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds than to go to their local university and therefore study uh, locally. So, this just summarizes some of the statistics of the graph that we, we just show you. Uh, so as I say, white male from higher socioeconomic backgrounds are the dominant group, group in economics. Black students from any socioeconomic background or gender are underrepresented in a uh, Russell Group universities. And So if we think about this, we have that less than one in 100 students in Russell Group universities are from a Black social economic background. So what are the challenges for students from lower social economic backgrounds? Well, we know students from low social economic backgrounds are more likely to take on part-time jobs, uh, be the first generation entrants, which means that they have less of the cultural capital to, uh, to understand, to navigate university are more likely to live at home, uh, usually for, due to financial reasons, at least in the UK, it's quite uh, normal to move away from home to go to university. But in the case of students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, they are more likely to live at home. Another reason why they go to the local universities. Unfortunately, they are also more likely to drop out of university and they are gonna be less likely to be awarded a good degree. So given that now we know that, what we know, we know that students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are less likely to study economics, but we know that economics is a good discipline to, discipline to promote social mobility. Well, there is a lot of things that we need to do, not just at university level, but this is kind of becomes government policy and trying to understand how governments have to change the widening participation policies in order to deliver uh, this or to change the situation. In the report, I'm gonna go a bit faster over this, but we also look at what we call the leakages from the pipeline. So when it's not enough to attract students because so far what we have looked is at the students who start university, that doesn't mean that all these students have actually finished university. And once after year one, so, uh, so let me not tell you this problems at A level in first place, but let me tell you, for instance, uh, something more about continuation. So once the students actually start university, how likely are the students to leave university or not finishing their degree? So there are some good news for economics. We see that most economic students are actually likely to continue their studies. Of course, we believe that the reason for that is that economics have higher entry requirements than other disciplines, but still it's a positive thing. It means that students who start studying economics actually uh, finish economics. The highest dropping rates are in year one. So the highest non-continuation rates are in year one. So students are more likely to start year one than to not turn uh, up for year two, either because they don't continue, they fail year one for these reasons. This is similar for all students as well, but we can see that the continuation rates are always higher for economics and for other disciplines. So that's good. However, 
the bad thing that we see is that these good continuation rates are not distributed uh, in a similar way across all academic years, across all ethnicities and across all the socioeconomic background. So for instance, here is quite complex picture, but focus on year one picture. As I say, after all, year one is the year in which students are more likely to drop. Uh, this goes down in year two and year two, uh, year two and year three. Here we observe the differences in percentages points from the students who drop out by ethnic background and by socioeconomic background for each ethnic group compared to the overall student population. So I told you in year one, continuation rates were around 92% in economics. That's good. So that means that more, a lot of students actually go from year one to year two. However, if we start looking at the ethnic uh, background differences, we see that the students who drop out tend to be the students from ethnic minority groups. So especially students from Asian Bangladeshi backgrounds, Asian Pakistani, all black students, and so on. The ethnic backgrounds that do quite well is actually Asian Indian and Chinese, uh, Chinese students. They tend to do well, they tend to progress even a higher rate than the uh, student population in economics. If we, in addition to that, consider these students' socioeconomic backgrounds, then we see that the no continuation rates are even higher for these students. So students from all, almost all ethnic groups have higher continuation rates, uh, no continuation rates in this case. What we also see is that even white students who are actually doing quite well, if they are from a lower socioeconomic background, they are less likely to continue in higher education. So this is a huge leakage that we have here. Perhaps it's not huge in terms of number, but tell us a lot about that the students are coming. So even the diversity that we are managing to attract to economics, right? With, through widening participation, through all these kind of initiatives that we have, they are more likely to leave economics at some point. This repeats in year two and year three, but I say the gaps are smaller, but also there are kind of the continuation rates are much higher in these years. Now, okay, so, but what happens to the students who actually get to the end? I say, okay, students who got to three year three and get to graduate. I told you, I'll tell you, I, and I'll kind of finish with this, but we see that, let's look at outcomes and let's talk about, about the degree classifications in the UK. In the UK, you can graduate with any marks between actually 40 and 100. Uh, very few students will get 100, but anything that is considered above 70% is considered a first class degree. Anything that is between 60 and 70% is considered to be a upper second class, a 2 1 degree. If the first two, the first class and the upper second class, is what we call a good degree. This is usually a weighted average of modules across all the years, or at least year two and year three. That depends on uh, student regulation, uh, sorry, on university regulations. But what we know is that good degrees are requested by employers and postgraduate programs. These are important. So we look at as well at who gets a good degree in economics. And so actually, let me just go directly to the conditional probabilities here. Who gets a good degree in economics by ethnic background and by socioeconomic background? Group one is what we have called a lower socioeconomic background. We have a series of characteristics there from lower socioeconomic background. And group two is from higher socioeconomic background. So on the left-hand side graph, you can see who gets a good degree. So 60 and above in economics. You can see that for 
all lower socioeconomic backgrounds, they are less likely to get a good degree. Still very high probability. So almost everybody gets a good degree, uh, a good degree, 80% of students, something like, like that. However, if you look at within ethnicities, we see that black students always get the lowest percentage of good degrees. Like right? whether they come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds or whether they come from higher socioeconomic backgrounds within their own group, they always get the lowest. So this reveals that there are still ethnic gaps in who gets a good degree. And this is important because if these students don't get a good degree, they are less likely to get the good jobs, they are less likely to become economists. And then when we tell us, well, why do we don't have black economists? They say, well, well, there is a problem here. We have to go back to university, well, even before, but this is an issue. If we look at the students who get a first class degree, well, now this is even worse. First class degree is over 70, so those students tend to earn even more money, et cetera. Again, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds get are less likely to get a good uh, uh, first class degree. If we consider bi ethnic groups, again, we see that black students are even less likely to get a good degree. And this has almost got worse over years rather than improved. And this is a very, very concerning aspect, a very concerning finding of this research. So this is just summarizing what I just told you. Graduates with good degrees tend to earn higher average salaries compared to those with lower degrees. We know that by research. Uh, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are less likely to receive a good degree, and they are also less likely to be awarded a fair first degree. Male students from black ethnic uh, groups have the lowest probability of being awarded a good degree, but they also have the lowest probability to be awarded a first degree, even if they are studying in a Russell Group University. And the ethnic gap between white and black students has increased in the five years under analysis. And we find that these findings have clear implications for late, later st stages of the economics pipeline when we see that there is less ethnic uh, diversity. So just summarizing our findings, we have that students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are less likely to study economics at universities, and those who do are more likely to drop out. Uh, we do see that there are fewer women in economics, but when women do choose economics, they are less likely to not continue, so they do well. And they are also more likely to be awarded a good degree in economics. So we can attract more women, they do well. We know that economics has a retention problem. Those are the leakages that I talked to you about, about continuation at least. Uh, these things I kind of mentioned before. And I think these are some of the implications of our research so far. Um, we see that the underrepresentation of students from ethnic minorities and lower socioeconomic backgrounds in Russell Group universities can perpetuate social inequalities and hinder social mobility. Uh, the, there is a limit, I talk less about this because I didn't talk about the university side, but there is a limited availability of economic degrees outside Russell Group universities, and that might be contributing to making economics an elitist subject. So this is a lot of work for policymakers. So yes, a lot of work for uh, institutions as well in trying to readapt the widening participation strategies, but there is a lot of work for policymakers and for employers as well, because once employers know this, they need to consider how the hiring uh, HR practices can try to address the inequalities that are embedded in the educational system. So I'm gonna finish here. Uh, thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stefania. At this point of our webinar, we will now open the floor for uh, questions and answers. Uh, Dr. Stefania, you can already stop sharing your screen so we can go to the plenary. 
So I'd like to invite all of the Zoom participants uh, to ask your question. You can raise your hand and I can call you and you can directly ask your question to Dr. Stefania. Alternatively, you can also type your questions in the Zoom chat. And to our participants in Facebook, you can also put your question in the comments section of the post. So again, uh, floor is now open for questions. And maybe to get the ball rolling, I'll probably start with that question. No, uh, so thank you again, Dr. Stefania, for sharing with us that you know there really is diversity when it comes to who gets to study economics. So I'd like to ask, based on what you've seen in the UK, are there any, is there specifically a best practice policy that you've seen they've done in the UK in order to make economics, the study of economics more inclusive, especially so, for, the, for the groups that you mentioned earlier, the ethnic minorities and also the, the, the women, for example. So any best practices that you think a developing country like the Philippines can also adopt? Definitely. Yeah. So things that perhaps we have, like, we don't talk too much about this because it's about the statistics, but I do another research and how to change the way that we teach economics is very important. So there is research there that shows if we base, for instance, our examples on what the textbooks say, and we all use more or less across the world, same textbooks or very similar textbooks in a way, the textbooks are biased. There is, a, there is a, uh, a research that shows that, for instance, the textbooks tend to use male as in uh, power positions, but women tend to be the household positions. So imagine if you are using these examples in a classroom in which you always perpetuate these biases towards female in a other type of roles and not as a be the policymaker, the economist, the business player. Uh, this is going to continue to perpetuate some of the biases. So the way we teach as well, it, it really matters. The, the way that we bring different voices into the into teaching, the way that we don't always teach economics, thinking that the people are going to end up working in banks or in in these sort of places. But economics is offers, you know. I'm doing research in economics that matches with education, I have colleagues that are doing research that looks at inequality. And so a lot of these other topics that we teach in economics that are very important and they are gonna code the attention of, of other group of students, not just female, it's important that we put this at the forefront of our teaching and not just base our teaching on like uh, working in finance or this sort of banking career, which are important if people like them, but that's not the only thing that we can do with economics. Thank you very much, Dr. Stefania. Now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Raul Fabella for his question. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you that uh, the School of Economics, where I teach 60% uh, of the undergraduates are females. And uh, some um, male faculty members are already talking about uh, an affirmative action in favor of males, or gender balance in favor of males. Um, uh, I don't know about the other um, uh, departments, but that is the case of the School of Economics. But the School of Economics in the University of the Philippines or only reflects the gender balance or imbalance in the Uni University of the Philippines as a whole, where 60% of the studentry are females. It is, however, very different in different disciplines. Um, uh, in, in hard sciences, uh, there would be very few females still. Uh, um, and uh, much fewer females than in economics, for example. But I'm, I'm interested in uh, your data in the comparison between the hard and soft sciences in terms of ethnic and gender diversity. And um, yes, first that, that, that uh, just it. And second, I'm interested in your data and what it says on uh, the differential between uh, the diversity, ethnic diversity um, 
among Asians versus non-Asians. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, I, I get that a lot that I put it forward. Like it is a very UK, US, Australia, European phenomenon this that we have less women studying economics because uh, I know that in India as well, I talked to someone and there are more women studying economics. So your 60, 40% kind of reflects also a bit what we have in the UK at university level. We have actually 55% of the population uh, at university in general are women women tend to go to university more than men. It's just in economics that we just see this not happening. And in fact, in the UK, we see that there has been a lot of campaigns to bring more female into STEM subjects. And in fact, there has been progress there and STEM subject, subjects are doing better in attracting female than economics is at the moment in the UK. So even in a subject like math, they have 35% of female, which is a bit higher than we have in economics. So when people sometimes say, oh, but women don't like math and there is a lot of money in economics, well, they like enough to go and do math, but they still don't do economics. So I think it's a lot about perception of what economists do in the UK. And if you think about in the UK, a lot of our students end up working in London, in the city. And I think some of these perceptions do not help us with the gender balance. With, uh, uh, the other question was about Asian. Uh, the Among Asian inter in inter ethnic minority um, uh, diversity. Yeah, so it's a the Asian group does kind of create a lot of debate because they just put like in Asian like everybody. So we have is of course for for historical reasons for uh, we have in the UK there is a big uh, population like sector of the population that are from Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi origins, but there is also a big Chinese community and they all go under the Asian uh, big uh, macro group. We do look at differences within these uh, groups, within these Asian groups, and we don't always show it because if we have less than 25 students in one specific group, we cannot show those statistics, but we do find that there are differences within these groups. So for instance, when we look at continuation rates, Asian Indian are actually much more likely to continue than Asian Pakistani or Asian Bangladeshi. So Asian Pakistani, Asian Bangladeshi are more likely to drop. How about, well, how about comparison with the whites? Asians and whites. Yeah, so Asian and whites are, almost, they go through university. When it comes to uh, degree outcomes, we still have some, some uh, ethnic gaps there. So white students are more likely to get a good degree or a first class degree than Asian students. However, during the last two years, the COVID years, 2019, 20 and 2021, we saw those gaps uh, decreasing. So Are you talking about they, economics or, or, or STEM sciences? Ah, economics, sorry. We saw that in economics. economics. We have, yeah, we haven't looked at the, the STEMs, like for degree out, outcomes, we don't look at the other subjects, we just focus on economics. Because um, in California, for example, uh, they have um, stopped affirmative action for Asian students because Asians actually um, dominate uh, the, the the campuses in terms of uh, of performance. So um, I'm and interested. Yes, yeah. So in, in uh, when we look at the widening participation initiatives in the UK, they are not targeting at Asian students in general. All this uh, because, as I say, Indians are overrepresented at uh, universities looking at more specific ethnic groups. So for instance, we see a, a, a Asian Bangladeshi, Asian Pakistani are less represented. So usually they are targeting these groups rather than the ones that are overrepresented. The, these these uh, differences in ethnic uh, diversity also suggests a, a, another question, which is, it, is, is it the fault of the educational system or it, it goes back deeper? goes back all the way to the households. Well, so we we can't control for many things, but what we do control for 
a student's background, whether the students have done the A levels in math and then levels in economics. And we also control for the UCAS point. We give an idea of how the students perform at schools. Even when control, all these statistics, these probabilities is controlling for that. So in that sense, we can say that it is something that is happening at university in any case. The students tend to live at university and students that are very good students coming to these universities with good A-levels, with good UCAS points, they still are doing worse. So of course, there is a, a lot of kind of things that we cannot control for. But we hope that by controlling for a student background at educational level before joining university, we can capture some of these things. And just to see the systematic way in which this happens, it still suggests that there is something that is happening at university. It might be just that these students being a minority feel less sense of belonging, they, they fail to develop and to engage with like university life, but it's still something that universities have to address. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Fabella, for your uh, questions. And also thank you, Dr. Stefania, for responding sure. to them. Now we have a question and a comment from Dr. Bing Rado. Uh, his question is, Dr. Stefania, does your data include information on the motivation of students, for example, career plan, as to why they exactly study economics at the university? So what is their why? Why do they actually take economics? And then no. as a comment, it may also be interesting to examine the profile of postgraduate students who may have a stronger influence in changing uh, research agenda in universities. Yes. So thank you very much, Ben, for those questions. Uh, no, we don't have motivation. So if you imagine the data come from uh, what the students feel this service, sort of service, this data when they join university through UCAS. And in fact, we have better data for uh, UK students that's where we focus on them than international students. And so there is not questions about why you are choosing this or why you are studying this. That's, um, that would be very good to have. And yes, that like eventually our longer term plans would be to look at more stages in the pipeline, so and therefore moving to, to look at postgraduate students. But of course, the, the thing that we said, like if we already have these leakages in undergraduates, those ones who can get to postgraduates are gonna be like a subset of the diversity that we started university, started economics in first place. So it's very important to look at these things, but definitely the plan is to move forward and go to postgraduates and then analyze PhD students. There is already some research, especially on gender and, um, and uh, uh, ethnicity, that you can see that gender actually improves at postgraduate level. So more women do masters and, than men. However, I think that has to do a lot also with the job market, but you know, that's, that's good. We have almost a postgraduate level, it becomes almost 50-50. Then when it goes to PhD, though, that goes back again, 30%, 70% for gender. And ethnicity, we see like ethnicity becoming smaller and smaller the, the further we go to the pipeline. I will assume that that's going to be the same for lower social economic background, but we haven't done that research. Thank you very much. I have a question. And looking at our Zoom uh, audience, I believe we have a lot of students joining us, very interested in your topic. So here's the question. Uh, what, would, what to you would be, based on your experience, what would, what would be the qualifications for one to really be considered to be an economist? And I guess, yeah, the young people are very keen to, to hear your answer on that particular question. So you mean to start studying economics? Yes. What would it take, let's say, for you to really be able to take economics and eventually thrive as an economist based on your experience? So, oh gosh, uh, that's, that's, a tough, that's the toughest question you could ask. Uh, yes. So studying economics, I, wouldn't, I, I have to lie to say that math is not important. Like math is very important. Like you, you need some mathematical tools. I will say it's like, it's not scary though. And I think that's the problem that sometimes people are just, oh my gosh, no, I wasn't that good at math and, and then I don't do it. Well, actually 
you just learn. And math is, is a tool like many other tools. The more you use it, the better you get at it. So it's not something that you either have it or don't have it. It's something that you have to learn. You learn it, you keep using it, you develop. That's, that's math. Yeah, and, and I have this kind of, like people have sometimes this idea, oh, I wasn't a math person or I'm not. So, you know, you just have to do it. You practice, you do it, you get good at it as anything. And some might be very good, some just might get along to kind of uh, do the basics, but that's great. I think it requires, though, a lot of uh, interest. And I think sometimes I have a lot of students that are very good at math, but they don't have enough interest in what's happening around the world. So usually when I start a le lecture, I never ask what is two plus two or tell me the root of whatever. But I say, did you read the news last, uh, last week? Did you see what happens? Well, what happened to inflation? What the central bank did? Because that's kind of the type of development that the students need to get engaged since the beginning. You cannot wait to kind of be an economist to start reading the news in a way. I say, no, you have to start reading the news now because that's what creates curiosity. That's what is that, why? How can I explain this? How can I do this? Why is this happening? And asking the, all these why questions and creating this and I find that at the moment, a lot of students are, are not developing this critical thinking enough. And critical thinking is not criticizing everything. It's asking why. Why is this happening? How can it be changed? And how we can move from here? Once you have that, then almost everybody should become an economist or have some knowledge of economics. Thank you. Uh, Takeaway, basically, ask why, be curious and be involved. And it's quite reassuring that you mentioned the thing about mathematics. It's not a showstopper. It's not something to be feared about. It's, some, it's actually a tool for you to become eventually a good economist. So thank you for those uh, thoughts and insights with respect to that particular question. And I'm looking at the Zoom chat. No further question. I believe in our social media. Also, no further question. I believe we've reached the end of the question and answer part. So at this point, first of all, we'd like to thank you again, Dr. Stefania, for sharing the uh, findings of your study. Certainly a lot of insight generated for us. Uh, we have a lot of students here as well. So hopefully they, you also uh, put good insights into their future economics and education plans. So at this point, I'd like to request uh, the department admin to please uh, share the screen again. So we would like to invite everybody to our next uh web seminar can you please put the previous slide so it will be about behavioral responses to temporary migration an examination of origin country fertility to be conducted by uh dr carolyn b theo harides associate professor of economics amherst college this will be on march 15 2022 wednesday at 10 a.m next slide please And we invite everybody to visit our website for the materials of our previous seminars. And we are also present in various social media platforms. We're present in uh, YouTube and we're also present in Facebook. And we're also present in Instagram and also present in Twitter.